right, hello everyone, and welcome to the first tech talk of the academic year. We're starting with a real bang, super bang, super excited about this one. All right, so this one, as I said, it's special, special for me for two reasons. Um, number one, the topic, um, ed tech, especially around continuous um, learning in organizations is of course very close to the mission of INSEAD. Uh, but I think for anybody today, I mean, any organization, I mean, these disruptive times, learning is critical for, for agility. Um, and, and so I think it's a broad, broadly interesting topic. And the second thing that makes this special is, well, partly that, that Chait's a former student, but really um, we've seen many, many founders in the Tech Talk series, but Chait is especially close to the school. I, I think many people drink the INSEAD Kool-Aid, I think Chait bathes in it every, every day. I'm not only a, a, an MBA alum, but formerly worked at INSEAD, um, has taught for us, partnered with us, been in an alumni leader. Um, so oftentimes I say, welcome back to INSEAD. Chait, I can't say welcome back to INSEAD, but um, welcome to the Tech Talk series. Please turn on your camera and come on out. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Very, very excited to be part of this uh, webinar. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, yeah, it's always great to be interacting, uh, of course, with you, as well as anything to do with the school. Very excited to be here today. Thank you. Great. So what I wanted to get your story out there, I thought we'd do three things. One is, let's do a snapshot of what Emeritus is about, how, um, and, and, and next to that, what are some of the dynamics in, in the market, in the, in the uh, training market you play in? Then let's do your origin story. I think many people would be curious how you got from your early days at INSEAD 20 years ago to where you're sitting today. And then finally, of course, as your former strategy professor, I want to hear about your strategy going forward. Um, and we'll be opening it up along the way. Um, Navita, a current student, um, will be monitoring the Q&A for us and, and feeding you questions, especially as we get into this. Um, OK, so Che. Um, Tell us what, what is, for those who aren't familiar, what is Emeritus? Sure, uh, go to the next slide. Uh, I think Emeritus, uh, we are a platform, a learning platform um, on uh, two-sided edX. Uh, on one side, we work with uh, some of the world's most reputed universities. Again, these are globally renowned uh, and uh, we have a bunch of them which are uh, regional leaders as well, uh, India, China, Latin America. So that's on one side. On the other side, we cater to working professionals as well as to enterprises in terms of helping them upskill or reskill. Right? So we can, uh, today we are, uh, we are offering a, uh, in our portfolio around 250 courses and uh, over the years we've touched uh, uh, over 250,000 uh, professionals from 80 different geographies. If you look at our uh, geography mix of our enrollment, it's quite global. Uh, so yeah, that's what we are. And maybe just double clicking as to uh, what we do or how we do in, in the next slide. Uh, again, this is not possible uh, in silos. So we are uh, we have a phenomenal team of uh, 1550 team members across eight countries, um, uh, extremely uh, global, quite spread out. Uh, and one unique thing about our courses um, is also the completion rate. They're very very healthy, 85 to 90 percent uh, for all the uh, you know uh, professionals who are taking our courses, companies who are uh, you know taking these solutions. And uh, uh, last fiscal, we have clocked 168 million, and that's uh, growing 2.6x for the next year. There's a lot of growth uh, built into it in terms of uh, because by virtue of our partnerships and by virtue of the market, which we will talk about. And uh, yeah, just over the last year, uh, we'll talk about the COVID impact as well. So just in oh, over the 250,000 cumulative enrollment, just last year has been 150,000. Um, and to deliver that, of course, it has to be done at scale uh, to maintain the quality. But in all this, Peter, I would just say that the core of it is our mission in terms of uh, how can we make high quality education affordable and accessible. Mm -hmm. And this is why we have like-minded partners, you know, like INSEAD, like uh, other peer schools, and uh, we our intent is to do it at scale. No, I, again, when we dig into the origin stories, I know the mission was important in, in really propelling this whole thing. Um, just again, to give people a sense of what Emeritus is about, 1,500 people, right? So you don't have your own faculty. What, what does that team do? Like how many of them are involved in the marketing side? How many are involved yeah. in the yeah. working with the schools to build the online courses? Sure, Peter. 
maybe i'll explain it uh, in uh, in uh, in the framework that you taught which is on the value chain right so we work across the value chain in this uh, 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 in this ecosystem what i mean by that is that we have a team which looks at the consumer insights customer insights and market insights to talk about uh, you know which are the courses that need to be developed uh, how they need to be developed what should be the learning outcomes that the the team focused on that then um, we have a university partnership team which has uh, discussions which um, which collaborate with the university partners in terms of uh, taking this identifying appropriate faculty and um, and then handing it over to our next phase which is our instructional designer team who builds these courses then it's a global uh, marketing and global sales right and uh, and finally it's the uh, student support because Uh, to handle um, on a um, hundred and fifty thousand uh, students in a given year, it, uh, I think no single uh, school will be able to do that, and we have built the capabilities uh, uh, to do uh, to do so. So I think we work across the value chain, right from the identifying a potential course opportunity to delivering it, and then helping um, you know students graduate. Um, and yeah, that's br- broadly our model, and that's how uh, our team is distributed as well. Maybe I can uh, just my you know I know all this, but I'm mindful of some people may not be as deep into this as we are. Um, just to give people a sense, the the courses that we, that you're launching, what fraction? These are you know this is a lot of this is coming out of the original MOOC movement. Um, but what fraction today are sort of recorded video videos and quizzes? But is there a live component as well? Yeah, so I think we consider ourselves to be one of the pioneers in the Spark model, Peter, which is small private online course, which is a converse uh, to MOOC. And what we mean by that, of course, you know, INSEAD has deep expertise in this as well, one of the early movers, uh, um, I would say. And so um, I think the fundamental to us is that uh, how can uh, people take courses, get upskilled or reskilled by achieving certain learning outcomes? I think the aspect of application or aligning to that learning outcomes is very, very important. So we do our courses in cohorts, right? So there's a specific start date and an end date. In between, um, it's um, uh, we reinforce it with live webinars with the faculty. There is group work or individual application work uh, that is there, right? And along with the asynchronous of the recorded videos uh, that you spoke about. So in our portfolio of uh, 250 courses, I think uh, maybe the origin story we'll talk about it, but uh, maybe four years back or so, 50% or 40% of our portfolio was uh, what these Spark courses. But right now, it's close to 80, 85%. So predominant, uh, uh, predominantly, uh, I think we've uh, moved towards offering this just by virtue of the demand and virtue of uh, how much more that needs to be done here. Well, let's again, if you've got folks, if you have clarifying questions, do put them in the chat. We can we can try and but you'll learn more as we we dig into this. Um, maybe just to look at you to start to move into the industry side. How there's now in my mind like. Emerging three big ed tech players at sort of the two and a half to three and a half billion level. Eriditis is now one. Two U was sort of the first that was came up, actually even IPO'd. Um, and obviously Coursera, actually maybe even and, and Udemy actually like maybe Coursera is maybe at the valuation a little higher, more up around five six. How how do you how do you see um, er, Emeritus as different than some of these other players and um, But also, is there some sense of convergence, you know, with to you buying edX and, and some of those dynamics? Sure. So uh, f- first and foremost, right. So when we look at the, the sector, or so, for us, the competition is not the other players, Peter. I think the competition is somebody who is not able to uh, come online or learn online. Right. So I think that's what uh, uh, we consider as uh, um, as competition or uh, maybe a non-customer uh, in, a, in a classical term uh, you know, who is uh, yet to experience it. Um, if uh, I think there is uh, enough and more data here uh, to say that even if you if you look at uh, the skilling market per se, uh, uh, which all the players that you mentioned are part of, so it's close to 400 billion uh, globally. Right. Number one. Uh, number two is uh, you know there is data from World Economic Forum which says that 50% of the workforce need to be reskilled within the next five years, right? And uh, you know that's over 500 million to start with. Just if you put these numbers together, right? So the cumulatively the revenue that the top five skilling platforms do, not the valuation, just the revenue, is less than 10% 
or it's less than 5% in fact of the skilling market that's out there, um, even lesser. So what I'm trying to say is that there's huge headroom mm-hmm. in this in terms of uh, for players to coexist and at the same time uh, uh, to impact or to amplify the impact of reaching more students or more professionals. I think that's the framing I would, I would look at it. And the other thing I would also like to add is that within the skilling market, I think there's a slide uh, uh, that we have on that. The university back skilling, as in if you talk of executed from the top 15 global university, that, that's even that's less than 1.2 billion. So it's a small sliver of the you know uh, of the 400 billion market that we're talking about. So which also goes on to say that there's a, a huge headroom there because it's growing as well. Right? So um, uh, in that sense, uh, yeah, uh, um, I would just think about somebody who is not who has not taken an online course or uh, yet to get into digital okay. learning as a, a competition rather than uh, the other way around. Right. So it's much more today about the non-customer and winning them over than fighting. It. It's not yet a red ocean. So that, that's good to hear. Um, just quick clarifying questions, then we're going to do these polls for you to react to. But just, again, to help people, what's the price point of a typical course? I know there's a range, but yeah. just give people yeah. a sense of the price point and whether, to what extent are you selling to individuals as payers or to what extent mm-hmm. are their companies paying? Just briefly on that. Got it. So uh, right now, um, uh, we'll talk about it in terms of, uh, so our aspiration is that to build a lifelong or a uh, learning ecosystem. So we have right now programs with our recent acquisition, uh, acquisition with ID Tech right from young adult uh, to a CEO. So in that sense, uh, Peter, the, the portfolio of courses we have, uh, uh, they range anywhere from the $800,000 to $75,000 across this ecosystem. Of course, it depends upon um, um, the, you know, the profile of the participants, the duration of the programs, et cetera. But on, a, on an average, you could take it around $3,000. And uh, uh, most of our courses, uh, median-wise, these are eight-week courses, which is a combination of uh, the SPOC, the small private online course, asynchronous videos, uh, live sessions with faculty, group work, and uh, uh, giving that uh, highest completion rate. So that's the core of uh, bulk of uh, our portfolio. Cool. Um, and, and again, it's a mix of individuals decide, but sometimes their that's, companies yeah, yeah. pay. That's, that's right, Peter. So I think for us, uh, if it, uh, it, it's a mix. So right now, around 30% uh, would be companies you know, nominating their uh, um, high potentials or employees to it and the rest are individuals taking uh, uh, the program. So again, this is uh, one trend that we are seeing. I think there's a lot of macro elements to it as to um, the rationale for upskilling and reskilling. We can talk about that maybe uh, during let's, the chat. Let's get a sense of the audience here. That's one of my favorite parts to, to check in. So we have a couple polls for you. The first is just how much um, online courses you're doing. We're gonna do the classic thing. We're gonna ask you, and this is anonymous, how many online courses did you sign up for last year? And, and then the second part of the poll is, how many did you complete? Please launch the poll. Um, very good, poll one, so you've got two parts there. Um, I cannot, as the, with the current settings, I cannot actually see. So someone will have to see. Once we have enough responses, you should um, uh, publish this. But of course, you know, I, I think just as, as you're working on your answers, obviously one of the things that you saw in the industry is the big MOOC platforms, the Coursera's, ended up having very low completion rates. Um, and, and one of the things that, that some of the higher end OPMs like Emeritus do is, is actually get people through. Um, partly by charging them um, non-trivial uh, tuitions, which turns out to be a motivator. Let's take a look at the answers, uh, Jake. So again, we're gonna have a, a wide group. Um, wow, that's amazing. 16% of people signed up for, for that and only 28% of the, the group um, didn't do anything. Um, and then if we go down here, um, at the same time, you look at the completion rates and you can see a, a sort of a yeah. significant uh, fall off, but that's, that's normal in the industry. Um, Chait, before you respond, yeah. why don't we do the second poll and you can respond to both pieces. Um, the second poll is really looking forward and, and thinking about the demand for new skills. Um, poll number two, uh, let's poll number three, please. In the next 10 years, how many job transitions do you anticipate to have? So these would be moderately significant um, transitions, the kind of things 
where you would need to learn new things to take on a new role. So zero, one, two, three, four plus. I've only got two years left as deputy dean, so that's at least one for me. Um, here we go, we'll see what, uh, and hopefully many more. Um, and let's see, this is the first time we asked this question. So here we go, in the next 10 years, um, in sea otters here, um, it, it's quite a distribution, but again, 45% um, um, at two and even um, almost 30% uh, at three or more. Okay, let's, Chait, why don't you come on back and let's close yeah. this down. Yeah, yeah. so I think the, the first thing is yeah. yeah. Uh, I think on the online learning, right, Alex, we had done this maybe pre-COVID, Peter. I'm sure the answers would have been very, very, uh, I think the responses would have been different. So over 80% have uh, explored or have the intent to explore an online course that says that, uh, you know, they're, first, they're interested in learning. Second, uh, they, that they want to reskill or reinforce their, their, any of the skills that, they, that they're looking at. But the, also the start thing is about the completion part of it, right? I think, as you mentioned, that... Uh, uh, there's a huge difference of how many people have chosen one course to how many people have completed uh, one course. Uh, at least there are uh, anywhere ranging from six percentage points to 10 percentage points or 20 to 30 percent difference there. I think that's one uh, a big, uh, uh, I think that's one aspect that we are trying to solve is in terms of, um, you know, how can we, how can the uh, Participants who are considering an online course, um, how can they be motivated to do that? Of course, by virtue of the payment, by virtue of the credential they get, etc. But also the support along the way, right? Uh, in terms of uh, it, with a for working professionals, whether the company sponsored or self sponsored, to engage in a course for eight weeks, twelve weeks, it's not easy. They have their uh, you know work uh, to manage as well. How could you provide that scaffolding so that uh, you know they're engaged and they could uh, you know com complete the cohort uh, is an important element. I think that's where uh, you know we come into picture, uh, uh, and that's one unique aspect of the programs that we offer as well. As uh, um, somebody rightly mentioned uh, recently, it's not just the content that's the king or a queen; it's the cohort. So for people to learn, especially online, that's very very important, and uh, yeah, uh, that has an impact on completion rates as well. Yeah. So what do you, um, just going to the pandemic, um, oh, clearly, you know, you're right place at the right time. Um, so I guess huge growth driver, but are you seeing other changes in, 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 the, in the sector? I don't know, longer form, and, you know, what, what other dynamics are playing out over the last 18 months beyond just sort of beyond a surge in demand? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, it, this crisis is unprecedented uh, uh, in a lot of ways for a lot of uh, um, uh, for a lot of us and uh, for a lot of sectors. I think one thing, one sector which has which has had tailwinds, if I may say, was uh, um, ed tech. And I think the fundamental shift is in terms of people's approach to learning online. Theater. I think earlier uh, that was uh, it was uh, uh, it was not it was a suboptimal choice or it was a fallback option, etc. But that. Uh, the pandemic has pushed it uh, to the front. And it's not just that even the technology to support it has, has evolved over the past uh, past decade. Um, and right now, uh, in terms of, uh, how, of course, you know, there are always pros and cons in terms of um, the, the Zoom fatigue or how effectively you can engage, uh, uh, you know, participants in an online format. But uh, uh, I think squarely what the pandemic has shown is that uh, one, online learning is here to stay. Now the question uh, becomes for uh, universities, uh, for players like us, in terms of in which form, you know, how much, uh, it, how much it could be blended within class, etc. So uh, I, I think the intent has risen. If I were to just answer in one word, of people for people's willingness to learn online, I think that's what yeah. uh, fundamentally. No, I didn't. If you had said to me in 2019, in 18 months, could you get 150 INSEAD faculty? used to teaching on Zoom, I'd say that is going to be impossible. How much money do, do you, you're giving me? And yet 18 months, we have, a, this is on the supply side, 150 INSEAD faculty who are used to teaching on Zoom. It's, it's a big shift on the supply side and, as you said, on the demand side. Super exciting. Yeah. Yeah, and also on that note, uh, Peter, earlier, even when we want to develop the courses, uh, I think there is some reluctance from some faculty or some faculty hasn't experienced that platform where it took a longer time, but now I think uh, that's been passed back. And of course, there's a different dynamic also for schools. 
because the in class has been impacted. I think revenues have been impacted across, and uh, I think then mm -hmm. looking at online as a strategic uh, uh, choice, um, I think has become far more pronounced. Um, okay, you know what? Why don't we, um, um, Navita? Do you want to? I want to move on to the origin story in a second, but um, do you want to ask one or two of the questions from the audience already? Thanks, Peter, Chet. Um, we're getting a lot of questions across different buckets, corporate governance, positioning, customizations, the future strategy. But let me start with the one that's getting the maximum traction. Um, how do you really deal with local certifying bodies and how do you really customize courses by region? That's good. Yeah. 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 So uh, I think uh, one is when, it, when we talk about the customer, uh, in, uh, the inside team that we have in Iveta, the one part is that, of course, there are, um, there are some geographies. For, for, for example, US, you have something called the NC, which is a labor statistics uh, database, which is published. There is a solid data to back in terms of uh, uh, identifying what are the skill gaps that are out there for various sectors uh, at various levels of management. So that's one thing. And there is Glassdoor, LinkedIn Insights, et cetera. There's a combination of that which can help us uh, choose you know, which sector, which level of uh, uh, management, what could be potential skills that could be relevant, right? So that's one part of it. The, then I think the not all the skills, for example, when you say uh, digital marketing or when you say business analytics uh, or uh, no, uh, data-driven decision-making, et cetera, there is no uh, a, a certifying body that needs to stamp. The, our approach has been to work with the schools, which are the thought leaders uh, you know, in these areas, and um, you know, let the faculty um, you know um, engage the participants as well as uh, you know send the point across. So uh, yeah, so there are other providers which work with trade bodies, etc. But um, us is more geared towards working with universities, who are the thought leaders in these fields in imparting the skills and then taking it to market. And each geography is very different in terms of at which uh, uh, where they are in that journey for that particular skill or which skill is relevant. So Nidia, thank you for that. That was helpful. And we'll be back to you for more questions in a little later. Okay, let's do a little bit on this origin story. So 20 years ago, Chait, um, tell us about Chait when you came to INSEAD for the first time and, and a few highlights about how you got from there to here. Yeah, sure, uh, Peter. In fact, yeah, uh, I was just uh, mentioning, so I came to INSEAD to do my, I had a very unusual uh, career. So I did an intern six month internship at NCED as part of my undergrad, uh, you know, um, uh, as part of my undergrad curriculum, and it, it was that that was my first brush uh, uh, with uh, NCED and the impact it had. So I was involved in developing simulations at that time, uh, uh, you know, working on some data sets for the faculty, etc. So um, um, I had that, uh, you know, first brush as an internship. Then I had an opportunity to come back to NCED to work on developing business simulation um, and uh, which is used in executive education. So I did that for uh, three years uh, before my MBA, you know, thanks to David Weinstein, who was my, uh, you know, who was the professor I was working with, and Miklos, uh, they really helped me push uh, to consider INSEAD. And I had a ringside view in terms of the impact exec, exec ed has on executive education has on uh, you know, participants and on companies. So uh, did the MBA, and uh, then I was uh, talking with the idea. I stayed in Paris for a year post that and was trying with this idea of how can we take this experience uh, to India, where, which is uh, my home country, right? So, uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, we, I was not sure about uh, what should be the product. As in, there is this idea of uh, this kind of an experience would be relevant there. There are some, uh, you know, models which were, uh, which were dabbling with that before, but not very successful. In fact, at that time, INSEAD itself uh, was trying to put a center of entrepreneurship in India. And uh, somehow that that didn't go through. So uh, with this background, uh, yeah, uh, uh, came to India uh, 08, 09, and uh, uh, and at the same time we were. It took a, a year, et cetera, just to trying to pilot some courses. You know, it could be a workshop or a conference, et cetera, uh, with this high quality uh, aspect in mind. Uh, um, but the, the first program, in fact, uh, that we have. Uh, um, that we went to the market. At that time, of course, I met my co-founder, Ashwin. Both of us shared this element. You know, he went to HBS. I went to INSEAD. We were huge beneficiaries of this education. Uh, we had this intent of how can we bring this quality education to the Indian market. I think that's where we're converging in. The first program we did, uh, we thought we'll assemble some practitioners, experts, you know, uh, do an open enrollment exec program in India, but it flopped or it didn't get the participants it wanted. It was a huge learning. 
So that's when we uh, thought that, okay, we have to work with a school of, uh, um, of, of a certain caliber, certain quality. And uh, yeah, so I, I, had, Rams uh, matter, I had a little- Brands matter. That's, that's right. It brand matters. And also uh, it took a lot of perseverance. I used to have a little more hair filter, but after the inject contract, I lost the rest of it. Uh, so it took us, uh, I think, nine months to a year, uh, you know, uh, in terms of presenting to INSEAD and then, um, you know, uh, convincing the school or, uh, or I would rather say that INSEAD took the bet. I think as it's been a pioneer in a lot of things, uh, I think it was uh, one of the first schools who took the bet of, okay, we want to invest in this project of um, um, running a leadership program in India, which is a 12-month long program um, aimed at uh, mid-career professionals. So, uh, and well, all the way right, so, yeah. It wasn't obvious how, as you said, how we were going to access even the mid-market of the Ind of the Indian market with our cost structures, and so it was a real alignment. I guess we have to fast forward a little bit. So there you are. You've got a co-founder. You've got a passion for access, but you're in India doing mostly face-to-face -face for live stuff. How yep. so? How did you then? Some of the pivots whereby, of course, you moved to yep. online, much more online. And to today, where you're global, 25% of your learners in, in the US, you know, big stuff in, in, in South America. What were some of the pivotal moments as you evolved the, the offer? Yeah. yeah, I think uh, I just put a slide also so that it's easier Please to do. explain if uh, uh, Pascal or uh, Sandra could Thank you. share. Yeah, but, pull up uh, that timeline slide. Great, thanks. I think that's slide number 14. 14. Um, so I think uh, that for us, 2010 is when our first program started, Peter, uh, along this timeline. And uh, the first five years right, of the journey is about uh, trying to perfect or trying to refine our product market fit. What I mean by that is that uh, then, you know, we started with NCA, it's a very complex program. Then we added partners. You know, there was Wharton who wanted to do programs of a different format in these geographies. Right, then there was MIT Sloan uh, interested in this. I think, for as you said, for a lot of schools, uh, the cost structure was preventing them uh, to do this. And then uh, we were you know, proposing uh, a way in which we could collaborate with them on the uh, on aspects of some curriculum as well as uh, delivery as well as uh, uh, sales and marketing. So, uh, uh, so we soon realized in 2012, 13 is that the market is not just India. You know, for for the brand that you mentioned about, you know, it's far more global. That's when we uh, set up our offices in Singapore and the Middle East, and uh, and were uh, you know, and we hired some talent, and we were um, doing programs uh, across uh, APAC, uh, India and Middle East. And uh, um, I think 2012, uh, 14, that's when the MOOC revolution um, uh, started, and there's a lot more uh, uh, receptivity from schools in terms of um, uh, looking at online as an option. Right, uh, and uh, we have, uh, in fact, uh, of course, you know, we, we pitched to INSEAD and a few other schools in terms of uh, how can we do these uh, short courses online. And that's when, in 2015, uh, we set up uh, Emeritus as a platform uh, to offer uh, these uh, online courses. Right, so I, until then, we haven't raised any money. We were bootstrapped. Right, so I think uh, at that time, you know, we were uh, profitable. Um, reach, we reached around eight million revenue. But for online, the stakes are different in the sense uh, one, of course, it's highly scalable. We're not restricted to 50 students or 60 students in a class uh, per year, right? So the, the other thing is also the investment needed in terms of course creation, uh, in terms of instructional design, in terms of uh, post-production, et cetera. And that's when we uh, thought, you know, we need to raise uh, uh, capital. And in 2016, uh, the CDSA was, uh, uh, was with Angels and a small boutique firm uh, for a million, but Series B was actually a pivotal moment for us because uh, uh, at that time, we were rejected by 20 funds uh, because- uh, 2016, uh, 20 funds. Yeah, 20, 20 funds, uh, because uh, most of them asked the question of, uh, what were you doing for five years without raising money? Right? <laughs> and uh, so it's more like a catch 20 or a chicken and egg problem. We said that we didn't need the money, right? Right now, you know, we have a different aspiration. Uh, we would like, uh, you know, we would like to accelerate. So I think, uh, yeah, Bertelsmann believed in the vision and uh, that's when we uh, got in. And again, all the investors, if you look at it, uh, these have a long-term view, uh, Peter. We are quite fortunate uh, in terms of to be able to choose, uh, even though, you know, we were 20 down, uh, to choose a, a great investor. Then with uh, Sequoia coming in is when we really expanded our wings in terms of uh, looking beyond uh, Asia and uh, getting into uh, Latin America. 
right? And um, uh, last year, 2020, just uh, um, just uh, during the time of the pandemic, um, yeah, we added uh, Maps First leads and Chan Zuckerberg uh, and launched a China operation, right? And uh, uh, and yeah, uh, this year we have acquired ID Tech, which is a K through 12 ad uh, young adult uh, uh, education provider uh, in the Silicon Valley with uh, our latest fundraise from Axel and SoftBank. I want to, um, Navidia mentioned that there were some questions on boards. So just as you as you start to bring in all of these, um, you know, big big stake, big sophisticated investors, how how did to pick up on that question, how did your corporate governance evolve? Um, what have you done on the boards? Who, which of these investors is sitting there with you? Yeah, uh, here I think all the uh, investors uh, um, they, they are sitting uh, they are sitting on the board right now, and but we have a, a, a majority representation from our uh, management uh, and the, the co-founders. Right, so uh, I, I guess uh, I think even before we go to the corporate governance, right, it's very important to align on the aspiration. I think there is a just like you have a product market fit, there's an investor uh, venture fit also to say that in what they would expect from this and are they aligned with our aspirations as founders? So that's been, uh, and do they have a long-term view? You know, because we are not in the, uh, with the mission that we have, uh, we don't think that, uh, okay, we will do this for one year, we'll pack our bags and go and they'll get their return. But we feel far more deeply about it in, in terms of if we were able to uh, influence or deliver programs for 250,000 students, can we make it 10x in the next three years? Even after doing that, it's still a small drop in the ocean uh, with, the, with the number of people we could uh, deliver this program. So yeah, I think uh, even before the, we talk about the aspects of corporate governance, the alignment is very, very important, Peter. And uh, second is that uh, these investors we added who, have a, who don't have a three to four year uh, view on their ROI, of course, every investor uh, has a um, has a return in my mind. But uh, these uh, they have a far longer view. In fact, some of the investors like Bertelsmann and Nasdaq they do balance sheet investing, so they're not uh, uh, they're not tied up to the LPs, etc. So I think that's that's basically we try to solve that. Thereby, uh, you know, the rest of the issues on corporate governance uh, the fell in place. Right. Okay, so um, we've got lots of great questions coming in. So I'm going to get out of the way in about five minutes. I guess just the last topic for me around strategy, but let's link it to resource um, allocation. 650 million round. Um, what's what's the project you sold to the investors? What are what's the priority um, or priorities um, for for the investment of that um, phenomenal? Influx of, of capital and, and really strong vote on the potential of emeritus. Sure. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, as I think the the same thing. I think the slides that we uh, that we shared with you. I think we went a little deeper, Peter. So there is no uh, nothing more to it here. In the sense, the uh, first and foremost, right? It's not that uh, this is a winner takes all market. Number one. Right. Number two is uh, um, this. Uh, there's a huge headroom because of. Uh, I think there is there is this statistic here that um, uh, in US the digital online retail in 2004 was like two percent out of the total retail, right? and uh, fast forward to 2019 it's like 11 percent, and you see the market that it has created. In a similar way, I think uh, digital learning right now is around like two percent of the entire skilling market, and if it's the same way it goes to you know 11 percent or 10 percent like the retail did. Um, this would be like a 30 billion market in itself, right? So, and in that, I think we are a 160 million player. And even as I mentioned, if I, we add all the top five uh, skilling providers, it's less than 10%. So there's a huge headroom here. And uh, second thing, uh, what is, uh, uh, what I think the investors appreciated in our model is that it's not concentrated. We are a global uh, player. So we have, in fact, uh, we work with local teams be it, for example, uh, in China, India, Latin America, Middle East, uh, uh, US. Uh, uh, so wherever we have operations or wherever uh, there is a, a significant uh, uh, market for us, right? So I, and that is something uh, that they appreciated. And the third part is that uh, with the ID tech, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are trying to build this lifelong uh, skilling platform. Again, that's the aspiration. And uh, uh, I think these are some elements uh, which resonated uh, with the investment company. Actually, I want to just, this is my last question before we open it up. So as former strategy professor, I always appreciated greatly your global reach. And again, the ability to say, you know, so much of higher ed is over-concentrated in the U.S. You're taking them global in ways they can't. And 
So as an NC auditor, you're building an ability to operate in LATAM in Asia, great, um, and a and, and nice strategy. I was, I have to say, a little surprised going into K-12. So um, I guess I got, I want to, I think I, I, I hear a little bit about the vision of lifelong, but um, maybe just explain to me a little more what you see the opportunity is and are, is how, what about the downside of just getting too stretched between the fast paced corporate ed market and also a very competitive K-12? True, Peter. And in fact, so that's why we took a long time in terms of trying to align with uh, the right kind of company. ID Tech, uh, the one um, that uh, we joined hands, so, so this is the company in Campbell, California, built over 20 years. So they have rich history, started by uh, two phenomenal women entrepreneurs. Right now, Pete, uh, you know, um, he runs it, and uh, it, it's run independently. Of course, there are the synergies for us is that. Uh, I think if, if we take a step back, right, even for young adults, uh, you know, teenagers, uh, so uh, there is, the idea is that how can you equip them with future-ready skills, right, uh, or cutting-edge skills, be it in, uh, you know, game development or coding or, uh, um, you know, uh, or cartoon or, you know, YouTube video making, which, again, um, um, the kids maybe a decade ago or five years ago are not doing, but now that's, uh, um, that, that's mainstream. So this is to do it in a fun way. And at the same time, right, when you think of coding, et cetera, why can't it be done, for example, with MIT? Right? Why can't it be done with uh, ETH schools like INSEAD? You know, talk about entrepreneurship, like how the summer camp at INSEAD happens, right? So the idea is that there is, a, there is an aspect there of uh, the top schools or universities can cater certain skills to these young adults to make them future ready. And that was the whole idea, and that was a synergy there. And also to take them uh, outside of US as well, where our capabilities can help people. So I remember when I launched the high school program for NCI, people said the same to me. Are you crazy? What are you? So yeah, but it, uh, it actually can work better than you think. Okay, um, Navita, you are up. I mean, to help uh, so many great questions. Why don't just, just fire them at Chait. Chait, try and keep the answers short so we can get through a bunch sure. of them. Yeah. Thank you. So um, there are two related themes that I'd like to bring up at this point. One is around inclusion. And the other one is around innovation and reskilling. So when we look at inclusion, how was the entire, uh, how would you really look at penetrating into rural areas where let's say internet access is very minimal? And uh, how, how, does you, how would you think of aligning with the UN uh, sustainable development goals? And on the second theme, which is innovation and reskilling, how do you really look at reskilling as well as training of blue collar workers? Yeah. So uh, maybe the second one first, right now, most of our courses, et cetera, they're uh, geared towards working professionals, not towards the frontline um, um, folks, uh, Nivedita. But again, it's in the works. Uh, we are working with companies in terms of um, how can we make um, um, deliver programs or uh, upskilling uh, up, up engagements for blue collar workers. But currently that's not uh, in our radar because there's lots more that we have to do, we need to do in the, in the current core areas that we operate in. The, the second thing on the, on the internet access, et cetera, right? So again, even if you look at uh, India today uh, to India, like three, four years ago, it, there's a, it's a huge stereotype to say that, you know, there is no internet access, right? So people are, um, I think the broadband is widely available, et cetera. Of course, you know, it's a challenge in some geographies, but I'm quite confident that technology will uh, ably, uh, ably solve it. Um, so, yeah, uh, for us, I think in terms of representation or, uh, you know, having aspects of uh, scholarships, et cetera, this is something that we are working with the schools to get underrepresented, uh, you know, segments or sectors get represented in the courses, uh, because, you know, more, all the programs they are working in collaboration with the schools, that's one part of the inclusion. But the other part, I think, uh, I'm confident that technology will play, play a huge role here. Thank you so much, Ed. Uh, the other theme that's coming up is partner organizations and how you partner with them. So like, what is in it for your partner organizations when they partner with you? And a slightly technical addendum to that, when you do partner with them, do you have your own learning management systems or do you leverage the ones of your partner? Yeah, yeah change. Should, should NCI keep working with Emeritus? Let's, let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we are partner first, Nivedita. I think as Peter, Peter would want to, want to hear. But yeah, uh, uh, I think on a serious note, uh, for us, we are, we are very uh, flexible to say that, uh, to your first question, right? What is, uh, what's in it for the partner or what do we do is uh, what Peter mentioned is in terms of giving them access to markets and to participants, which otherwise uh, on campus that might not be possible for them, right? 
plain and simple. So this uh, we're talking about uh, not just like uh, uh, not just getting from uh, one country or two from 80 different countries because of our marketing and uh, and the sales engine we are able to do that. Number one. Number two is that it's also giving them insights uh, because of a rich uh, we offer 250,000 uh, courses. We have three million plus uh, uh, you know users on our platform. We can mine rich insights which we can share with our partner institutions, which will inform future course development. That's that's the second part. The third is, is uh, the other point you asked is that the learning management system again it's partner dependent. Uh, more, uh, most of the partners, they work on uh, the learning management system that we have. Uh, for uh, uh, for others, you know, even with INSEAD, INSEAD works with a different learning management system, we uh, adapt to it. So yeah, it's partner first, it's based upon their preferences and uh, how, uh, uh, how the process is run, at the, at the, uh, their preference for the process of the platform. Yeah, actually, one good thing about having you answer the question, ask the questions, I can also give a little answer. I think from what I see in the industry, it's a huge debate point. So clearly, the big OPMs like Emeritus are adding a lot. And so as you see, lots of schools are working with them, but there's definitely debates about how much do we want to do inside versus outside. And it's, 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 it, it's quite in flux. And, and you see schools doing both, right? Working actively with Emeritus, but also doing some of the, the development and launch on their own. So it's a really a pretty exciting area right now, very much, uh, very dynamic. Thank you so much. Um, next, moving on to a slightly more insider's perspective on this entire journey. So what would really be your advice to entrepreneurs who are beginning their journey? And the second part of that is once Sequoia came in, how did the conversations in the next round really change? Uh, great question. Uh, yeah, so I think... Uh... Uh, the advice, uh, I, I, I think it's very, uh, very, it's a loaded uh, word in terms of talking about advice, but uh, I can share my perspective because each journey, every journey is very different. But this, like, I remember this very well, uh, you know, you walk into the INSEAD Ponte campus uh, um, and you have this library on the left. So there is this statue of George Dorio there. It, it says that, you know, without action, the world will still be an idea. I think the, that's the first thing that really uh, it struck me right from 2001 when I went to campus. And I would just say that uh, you, uh, if there are ideas, there are Excel, Excel sheets, et cetera, and there are models, but you have to do it, right? number one. And uh, the, I would really think that uh, the, the failure is not about not getting the revenue. The failure is not trying. Rather. Right. Uh, but having said that, right, you can't just jump and do whatever you want. There has to be a method to that madness. So, uh, and in that sense, uh, uh, from my particular journey, I can share that uh, there's a lot of time that's spent on the product market fit, as in one, is it solving a pain point, right? So right now, I get uh, a, lot, a lot of mails from uh, uh, friends as well as, uh, uh, you know, uh, from my alma mater, which talks about, okay, I want to, there's a lot of funding across in edtech. I'll start an edtech company right it doesn't work that way right you have to really think <laughs> about you you should have ex, you should experience a problem or you should be close to that uh, pain point and you should have a solution to that pain point and preferably somebody should be paying for it for the solution that you have so that's what i meant by product market fit i think that's very very uh, critical right and uh, everything else uh, uh, stems from that uh, we share you know between our co-founders that uh, the best form of investment is from your customer not from an investor so I think, uh, yeah, if you're able to have a product market fit where people are seeing, uh, which is what happened luckily in our journey the first five years, uh, I think uh, uh, one could be set up for uh, scale for larger things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, any other insights specifically on, you know, once let's say you have a big investor on board, how do conversations yes. really change in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, uh, so one is uh, the because of the, for example, yeah, you asked about Sequoia, right? So I think one thing that we learned from Sequoia is that Sequoia has been a backer of enduring companies. You know, when we thought about it, what is it that we uh, we would like to aspire for? I think that thinking uh, it has been influenced by uh, Sequoia and our uh, partners at Sequoia because they have really backed, uh, you know, huge companies, uh, right? So that have really made, a, they call it the dent makers. Right? So that uh, uh, philosophy really resonated with us in terms of how can we be this, uh, um, be this uh, player in this sector who can help define this category rather. Right? So, um, so I think that's one. And second is that for us, you know, here we are at that time uh, uh, when Bertusman 
was there, Sequoia was there, we were based in Mumbai. For us to access the global talent pool, right, uh, uh, while we were expanding our operations, it's because of uh, thanks to investors like at that time, Bertrand Spence Sequoia, which enabled us to do that in terms of uh, uh, exploring possibilities to open our office in China or uh, attracting talent in the, in the Bay Area uh, using their uh, network. And connecting it to uh, connecting to companies, uh, you know, in Latin who have started up and doing well, etc. So I think that's the knowledge that uh, they have helped us, as well as uh, they really pushed our thinking in terms of how can we be this enduring company. Thank you so much. Uh, there are a couple of questions around your equity journey. So uh, I see people write that I see founders really concerned about giving up equity. Could you share how was your equity journey from the starting point? Uh, I mean, any overview on that? And like, how how do you really look at equity versus, let's say, convertible debt? Uh, so, sorry, can you repeat what what exactly is the question with respect to equity? When you brought in all this big funding, was it an issue for yeah. you giving up, you know, big shares of the company? To, as you know, you you've raised a lot of money, but um, yeah. there's yeah. a cost to that. And and what was emotionally and practically, how was that? Yeah, uh, I think uh, yeah. Uh, for, for us, it's more about the value that we're creating, uh, Peter, rather than uh, okay, uh, am, am I diluting five percent, ten percent, etc. So uh, by coming uh, by with access to this fund, number one, and uh, the aspiration that we want to build in is that does that fit in? And second, more importantly, as I mentioned earlier, that is the investor aligned with their aspirations. Having said that, because we have, uh, uh, haven't raised or uh, we brought the company to a certain stage and we raised like after five, six years, still our, the management team and our, um, the, the founding team, we own the majority of the company. So I think that helps us in terms of uh, uh, influencing or um, you know, doing things uh, which we believe that uh, you know, uh, is, is impactful and works well in the market. And of course, our investors are very supportive. But uh, broadly, I think uh, uh, I would just discount the fact that, uh, uh, okay, should I dilute 10% or 15%? I think we should just try to take a step back and look at a bigger, bigger picture to say that, can this investor be with me in rain or shine? Right? Do they believe in this vision and are they willing to walk with us? I think that's far more important. And of course, you know, the value that you make in the process. I mean, I have a, maybe a follow-up question since you're interested in the investor side. Do you, you know, in the, in the years now that you've been interacting with, with institutional venture capital, have you seen them become more interested in impact? Again, this is maybe a, not a, a tough question. Again, you, you have to be careful how you answer, but still, I mean, do you find them, their objectives, um, their interest in impact and education and SDG, have you noticed some, some difference in the nature of the conversations um, with the venture capitalists over the last three, four years? Yeah, I think, Peter, the market itself has become far more aware and more conscious to that, act, to that aspect. What I mean to say that even the, uh, for example, uh, the impact is, uh, is, uh, is central to somebody's willingness to pay. In the sense, if the course is... Uh, impactful or you know if uh, so there are two kinds of impact i'm talking about the personal impact or can the did the what i learned something did it move the needle for me that's one part and the wider social impact that you mentioned so on the uh, the impact that we could uh, have on the people because by virtue of the high quality courses we provide and by virtue of the accessible price points we provide i think that uh, is a testament for the repeat coming in or, uh, uh, you know, word of mouth building in or, um, um, or you know, more people accessing it. And of course, the university partners being happy about it as well, because for us, our primary and um, the stakeholder in this is our university partners. And for university partners, I think impact is central, as in, can I, uh, can this course is of high quality? Can it, uh, you know, improve the learning outcomes or does, does it meet the learning outcomes? These elements are very, very important and we try to cater to that. And in the process, there's a willingness to pay because people for a high quality course in your field and for, uh, uh, for, for something where, uh, you know, they've learned something or met their learning outcome, people are willing to pay that particular money. So what I'm trying to say is that because the market is, is receptive and it's central to that. Of course, you know, uh, the investors are, are very much aligned to that. And uh, in fact, um, all the investors, you know, um, who are on, on our board also, uh, they're quite aligned to this thing about how the broader uh, social impact because of the, because of accessible high quality education, the cascading effect that it could have. I think they subscribe to that. I think that's the reason uh, they're, they're very happy to share the journey with us. 
Maybe to maybe pick a last couple of burning questions um, for Chay from the audience. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I find this question very intriguing, but do you see the emerging markets being priced out? For emerging markets being priced out? Do yeah. you see the emerging markets being priced out of the education uh, sector? I mean, is this really, yeah. a flip side, is this really giving access to aspiring managers in Africa or, you know, un, you know, or underdeveloped parts of the world, if we were going to push you? Yeah, yeah. so uh, I think that see, there is a definite, uh, you know, price segmentation that's out there, uh, even with the courses. So there are the courses, for example, that we run with top institutions in India or in China, uh, even in Latin America, they are at a, uh, it's a 33% uh, difference uh, or less uh, expensive compared to the courses that we run with the global schools. So we take that into account based upon the willingness to pay, like number one. And number two is that uh, uh, I think the markets are also quite huge. If you look at Latin America or if you look at India in terms of people willing to upskill or, uh, um, or uh, the addressable uh, population that's out there. So... With these both uh, parameters in mind, we, uh, one, uh, take the courses to the market which are relevant, second, price it appropriately. And of course, you know, at different price segments is a, a very different market, but we, 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 would, uh, we are positioning our, prod, uh, our programs because of the schools that we work with and because of the um, price that, we, uh, that uh, we are charging at a, at a certain segment, yeah. And it's access, accessible to some segments and it's not accessible to others, yeah. And we're not saying that we will serve everybody out there in the market. Well, thank you so much. I guess I'll hand it back over to you, Peter, for maybe one broad question that you would like to sure. end sure. with. Very good. Well, I have, I have actually, I'm actually going to do two. We'll, we'll do a little inspirational question at the end. But first, again, what I take away, Che, is again, you're in a great spot. It's about scaling up what you do um, and all that. But I, I did want to probe a little bit some of the trends that are happening now. So one thing that's happened in the pandemic is in the, in the, in the B2C side is streaming, right? Netflix and then Disney Plus and, and Amazon Prime. It's a huge, this sort of on-demand consumption of content on the, on the entertainment side. Um, how does that mean, what does that mean for your space at ed education and are there things that you're doing in there? Yeah, uh, I guess, yeah. Uh, maybe to start with entertainment and education are very different words, although they appear under E in the dictionary, Peter. But nevertheless, right, so what the, I think what it has done is, uh, I think the tech infrastructure has really uh, moved up, right, in terms of uh, for you to give high quality content, which is one part of education, not the, not the whole thing, the, the, the aspects that mm -hmm. we're doing. I think, uh, I think that, that has, uh, uh, that has really changed. And even the, 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 if you look at from a, a customer point of view or the consumer point of view, right, how they're consuming the content, you know, in smaller screens or, uh, you know, uh, uh, or iPad kind of screens, a tablet kind of screens, et cetera. Uh, so how they're consuming content earlier, it used to be with TV or a cinema, now that has changed. So in a, in a similar way, maybe one aspect of education which could mean is uh, watching a lecture, right? Maybe there uh, this could have a rub off effect, but uh, I think education is much more than that. I think uh, we... We talk about, uh, I think this, uh, Ilian wrote about this vertical learning as well as horizontal learning. So the aspect is that, okay, there's one part which can be given, but how do you create that cohort? You know, how do you create that uh, push somebody to apply to their workplace or uh, to their job, what they've learned? Uh, I think th those elements have to, uh, have to be built, have to be brought to life. Right? Um, yeah, so I, I would say that there could be some uh, uh, rub-off effect, but uh, not entirely comparable. Okay, um, that's great, no, for sure. Um, and then I guess to, to start wrapping up, um, so, you know, amazing, amazing story so far. And, and again, still much of the, your story not yet written. So that's very exciting. Um, but maybe just to reflect a little bit, how did, just to make it explicit, how did your time with INSEAD in, in, in the different ways, um, how has that sort of contributed to, to your story and, and, and your achievements? And, and, and secondly, again, You've got this sort of INSEAD community, many people in the community here. Um, any messages you have for them or things you'd like to share at the end of the webinar? Yeah, sure. I think uh, there is, a, you, uh, you can take the, you can, you can take me out of INSEAD, but not INSEAD out of me is, is what I would start with, uh, Peter. But 
I guess the, the genesis of this uh, idea from my perspective, it originated because I had the chance to go to INSEAD and interact uh, you know, with the professors, uh, with the uh, executive uh, members, as well as participants to see this, to have a ringside view of that. So I think the, uh, the genesis is attributable to that. And even not just that, right? So INSEAD has been the first school who took the bet on us. You know, when we were nobody, literally, right? So that again uh, talks about the uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of the school, which is very ingrained right from its, uh, you know, right from the way how it started, also right uh, post World War Two, uh, and uh, uh, and al along the way uh, when we were starting up in uh, in India, also the alumni ecosystem, how it has helped us. I think that's uh, that's phenomenal uh, in terms of helping us, giving us a platform. And uh, you know, helping us reach out to uh, businesses as well as individuals uh, by virtue of it. So, uh, and uh, it, and also when it came to our online, uh, instead has also really pushed us in terms of evolve our solution. So I think uh, uh, it, it's an un uh, it, it, it has been there uh, throughout the journey. I would say right now, you know, if I could contribute uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, being part of a case study for a digital transformation course or uh, to teach in the capstone. It's, it's a great fulfilling feeling to be able to give that back. But uh, I guess uh, to the to our, uh, friends or the alumni or the students who here, I would just say that it's more, I would just say that you should just give to the community. 